All right, hello everyone. Today we're gonna to be talking about six rules for using commas. Now, we've got a couple things going on today. So first of all, know that you will be reviewing the entire video, but along with this, you're gonna be completing the handout. So make sure you have your handout before you get started. Now, when you're reviewing the video and completing your handout, you're gonna be doing three things specifically. You're gonna be filling in the blanks for your notes, so make sure you get that all in, even if you need to pause the video periodically to make sure that you're filling in the entire blank. Then we're gonna be completing the sample item together, and then I want you to take some time, either pause the video if there's enough time provided, I want you to complete the independent practice item that's given to you to see if you can do this activity on your own. So let's go ahead and get started with the first rule for using commas. All right, rule number one for using commas. Use commas to separate items in a series. Now, items in a series are when you have multiple things that go together, like in a sequence. So let's look at our sample item here. The sample item reads, be sure to pack clothes, a blanket, and toiletries. Now someone is obviously going on a trip and there are multiple things that they need to pack with them. The three things that they need to take are clothes, a blanket, and toiletries. That's easy to figure out, three items. So we're gonna place our commas after each separate item. So it would be, be sure to pack clothes, which is the first item. The second item is a blanket, so we're gonna place a comma there. And then the final item is toiletries, but because this item comes after the conjunction, there's no other comma needed. Okay, so if you will please go ahead and complete the independent practice. The sentence reads, I like to jump, to run, and to hop. There are a couple things that I like to do in that sentence, so make sure that you put your comma in after each individual item. Okay, so, I like to jump, that's the first thing in our series, so I'm gonna place my comma there. The second thing that I like to do is I like to run. So now I'm gonna place my comma after run. And then the third thing in this series is to hop. So I like to jump, to run, and to hop. Now, did you know that the top three movie series going from third to first, the third is Star Wars, the second top movie series of all time is Harry Potter, and then the most popular movie series are Marvel comic movies, like The Hulk and Iron Man and things like that. I wonder how many of you guys have actually seen those movies. I have. All right, let's move on for the second rule for using commas. Make sure you're filling in your blanks. Rule number two says, use commas to separate two or more adjectives before a noun. And you might want to make a note that it might, the adjectives might come after a noun sometimes, and you'll see that in our sample sentences here. So again, the rule is use, two, use commas to separate two or more adjectives before a noun. So our sample sentence says, the crowd at the football game was loud, rambunctious, and out of hand. You know what that's like. I'm sure everybody's been to some type of sporting event that's been loud, rambunctious, and out of hand. So there are basically three adjectives or adjective phrases here that are describing the crowd. First of all, the crowd was loud. So I'm gonna place a comma after loud. Secondly, this crowd was rambunctious. They were a little rowdy. So I'm gonna place a comma after rambunctious. And then the third adjective or adjective phrase is out of hand. So, that is using commas to separate two or more adjectives that describe a noun. Go ahead and do the independent practice and let's see how we do with that. The independent practice reads, the dirty blue car raced past the police car. Okay, so you're gonna wanna identify the noun and the adjectives that are describing that and then make sure that you're separating two or more adjectives with a comma. So in this sentence, the noun that's being described is the car. Well, what does the car look like? Well, I know that the car is blue, and I know that the car is dirty, and that's kind of like my car. So we've got two adjectives that are describing one noun, so we're gonna place the comma in between them. The dirty blue car raced past the police car. Now, did you guys know that the five most commonly used adjectives are good, new, first, last, and long? So you actually wanna avoid using those adjectives because they're commonplace and boring. So in your writing, 
or in your text messages, you should avoid using those five most commonly used adjectives. Moving on to rule number three. All right. The third rule for using commas is use a comma before a fanboy conjunction that joins independent clauses. You know your fanboy, say them with me. For and nor, but or yet so. So you're going to use a comma when you use a fanboy to join two independent clauses or two complete sentences. So in our sample sentence here, it says, Josie would like to miss some days from school, but she is afraid of getting behind. Now in that sentence, we actually have two independent sentences that we've put together with a fanboy. The strategy that I recommend using for this type of long sentence, this type of complicated sentence, is first of all, find your fanboys, and sometimes there might be more than one. That's the only one I see here. And once I found my fanboy, what I do is I look at the phrase or the clause before the fanboy and ask myself the question, is this a complete sentence? Could it stand alone? And again, it reads, Josie would like to miss some days from school. Yeah, that's a complete sentence. So that does pass my independent clause test. But I still don't put a comma there until I determine whether or not the clause after that fanboy is a complete sentence as well. She is afraid of getting behind. She is afraid of getting behind. Yep, that's a complete clause as well. That's an independent clause. So that passed my independent clause test. So I will put a comma there before my fanboy. Now, you guys, go ahead and do this independent practice. The strategy that I recommend is, first of all, locating your fanboys and then asking yourself the question, is the clause of the phrase that comes before it complete? And is the clause that comes after it complete? And if so, you do put a comma there. So, the independent practice sentence reads, Angie was absent today, so she can't go to the game. Angie was absent today, so she can't go to the game. So, here is my fanboy, right here. And I'm going to see if this passes the independent clause test. Angie was absent today. Well, yep, that's a sentence. I've said that oftentimes. All right. And then, she can't go to the game. Well, yep, that's a sentence as well. That passes my independent clause as well test. So, I do put a comma here. Angie was absent today, comma, so she can't go to the game. All right. Now, let's go ahead and move on to rule number four for using commas. Rule four reads, use commas to set off non-essential clauses or phrases. What does it mean to be non-essential? Well, basically that means it's not important and you don't need it. So if you have a part of your sentence that actually doesn't have to be there in order for you to understand the main idea of a sentence, then it's non-essential. That means that you could take it out. Now, sometimes non-essential clauses come at the beginning of sentences. Sometimes they're stuck in the middle. So let's go ahead and take a look at these sample items and see if you can understand what a non-essential clause or phrase looks like. This sentence reads, Mr. Beattie, the principal of HHS, drives a Mustang. Now, the main idea of this sentence is that Mr. Beattie drives a Mustang. But I'm given a little bit extra information about Mr. Beattie. I learned that he's the principal of Heritage High School. But do I need to know that to understand that he drives a Mustang? I don't. So that's considered non-essential. So what we do in this case is we actually wrap this non-essential clause in commas. Basically, when we do that, we, we're basically saying that we could actually take this whole clause out of the sentence and we still are left with the main idea. And that's the case. What we needed to learn from this sentence is that Mr. Beatty drives a Mustang. So you guys go ahead and do the independent practice now. It reads, Mrs. Campbell, Heritage Teacher of the Year, inherited $1 million. $1 million. Now that's the main idea of this sentence. Now it was nice that she was Teacher of the Year, but if she inherited a million dollars, I don't really think that's the most important thing here. So go ahead and decide where would you put your commas. Now in this sentence, the non-essential clause is Heritage Teacher of the Year. Again, I can take out that non-essential information and be left with the main idea. So I wrap this non-essential clause in commas. I put one before it 
and I put one after it. So the main idea, again, is Miss Campbell inherited $1 million. Now, did you guys know that you have some non-essential parts too, that I could actually take them out of you and it wouldn't matter? There are many body parts that are non-essential. A couple of those, first of all, are your appendix. We could take your appendix out and it wouldn't matter. We could take out your tailbone. You actually don't need a tailbone. How many of you guys have ever fallen down and go, oh, my tailbone, and if you didn't have it, you wouldn't have that problem. We could take out your wisdom teeth because you actually don't need those. Those are non-essential. You don't need goosebumps. Okay, you have goosebumps and you get them when you get cold or excited, but you actually don't need them. They serve no purpose at all. And men don't need nipples. They serve no purpose. So, like many sentences, you have some non-essential parts too that could be taken out. But we're not going to wrap yours in commas. All right, let's move on to the fifth rule for using commas. All right, rule five for using commas. It says, use commas after certain introductory elements, including subordinate clauses. Now, this can get a little complicated, so let's refer to our sample sentences here. The first sentence says, when Mr. Knight walked into the class, everyone got quiet. When Mr. Knight walked into the class, everyone got quiet. Hmm. Now, the introductory element to this sentence is when Mr. Knight walked into the classroom. The main idea is everyone got quiet. Everyone got quiet. Now, that's actually the main idea. The subordinate idea is when Mr. Knight walked into the class. Now, one rule of thumb that I like to use for this rule is if you can take the clause or the phrase that you've set off with a comma and move it to the end of the sentence, you know that you've put your comma in the right place. Now, this doesn't work all the time, but it does work a lot of the times. So let me just tell you or show you what I mean. If I put a comma here, basically I'm telling you that I can actually move this entire clause to the bottom, of, to the back of the sentence. And it would read, everyone got quiet when Mr. Knight walked into the class. Now that makes sense. So I know that I actually put the comma in the right place. This doesn't work 100% of the time, but about 90% of the time, this is one good way to help you check to make sure that you've put your comma in the correct place. So go ahead and do the independent practice sentence and see how you do on this one. It reads, wiping her face, Toya calmed down and returned to the court. Where would you put the comma? Okay, if you put the comma after face, you're absolutely correct. And go back to that strategy to, that I mentioned earlier about moving clauses around to see if it works here. Toya calmed down and returned to the court, wiping her face. Hmm, I'm not sure if we changed the main idea on that one. But in this case, this is an introductory element. My main subject is here. My main verb is right here and here, and so I would place my comma there. All right, moving on, and hopefully you guys, again, you've filled in all your notes, you're getting all these down. We're at the end, we're at rule number six. Rule number six for using comma reads, use commas to set off an expression that interrupts a sentence. Now, this has to be my most famous, my most favorite rule. And you'll see why in just a second. Again, use commas to set off an expression that interrupts a sentence. Sometimes, especially when we talk, we kind of interject information into our sentences to make a point, to kind of get someone's attention, if you will. So let's take a look at these sample sentences and see what happens if you don't set that off with commas when you write. The first sample sentence reads, yes, I would like to go. Now, I have an interrupter at the beginning of this sentence. The word yes actually isn't necessary. It's almost like dialogue. That's kind of what interrupters are. It's kind of like a form of verbal communication. And then, of course, when you write that down, you write it like that, but you need to make sure you put your comma there. And oftentimes, you can remove interrupters from a sentence and it still makes sense. So it's almost kind of like a non-essential phrase or clause. So, like, if I took the word yes out here, I would still have a good sentence. I would like to go. Now, look at the, sample, the second sample sentence. This is my favorite one. If you eat grandma, we can go. 
Hmm. Hopefully nobody out there is thinking about the process of eating grandma right now. Okay, we're actually talking to grandma and we're telling grandma if she would go ahead and eat, then we can leave. So grandma becomes the interrupter. This is a verbal form of communication. And when you write it down, you have to set off that interrupter so that we don't have an awkward sentence there. If you eat, grandma, we can go. And by using a former strategy I just mentioned, you could actually take the interrupter out. If you eat, we can go. And so that strategy works there. Take a look at the two independent practice sentences and see if you can do those on your own. All right, so let's take a look at the first one that reads, okay, when are we leaving? Okay, when are we leaving? Well, we say that all the time. And so the word okay is actually an interrupter at the beginning of a sentence. We don't need okay. It's just kind of a mild explanation. Okay, when are we leaving? So we can actually take that out of our sentence and be okay. When are we leaving? And we're left with that question that makes sense on its own. Now, look at the, sam the second sample. If you study John, you will make an A. If you study John, you will make an A. Well, we're not actually gonna study John. But if John will study, then he'll make an A. So in this case, the name or the word John is the interrupter. We're actually speaking to John. So it should read, if you study, comma, John, comma, you will make an A. You place the entire interrupter within commas, which means you put one before the interrupter and one after the interrupter when it appears in the middle of the sentence. So, and I can even take out the interrupter and the sentence will still make sense. If I remove that, if you study, you will make an A. And you know what guys, if you complete your note sheet, do your practice work and learn these rules of commas, you will make an A too.